Thanks for tuning into this Revision Zone Maths video. In this video, we'll be looking at differentiation, but in particular, uses for differentiation. So unsurprisingly, there are lots and lots of uses for differentiation, but for now, we'll be considering four, four main uses. The first one would be calculating things called stationary points. So calculating stationary points. The second one would be determining the nature of stationary points. Determining the nature of stationary points. The, th the third would be determining if, if a function is actually increasing or decreasing. So determining whether a function is increasing or decreasing. And lastly, four would be actually describing Describing complicated relationships, which are not going to be possible with equations that don't have, have derivatives in. So for now, what we're going to try and do is go through each, each one of these points and, and get a better understanding for, for what we mean by them exactly uh, and, and how, how to sort of work with them on the, on the A-level syllabus. What is a stationary point? Well, in a nutshell, a stationary point is a point at which the derivative of a function is actually zero. So let's write this down in, in sort of mathematical language. So we say, let a b be a point on a curve y equals f of x. Right, we say that the point AB is a stationary point is a stationary point if the derivative of the curve evaluated at the point x equals a is actually zero. Obviously or equivalently because we can write this in in the Newtonian notation, we take the function f, we differentiate it, we evaluate it at the point x equals a, and if that happens to give us zero, then we say we say there's a stationary point at the at the point a b on the curve y equals f of x. Now it's interesting to note that a stationary point is actually a point, so it's a location location on the on the curve. So perhaps I should I, sh I should write this here. The remark. A stationary point stationary point is in fact a location on the curve is in fact a location on a curve right so given that it's a location on the curve uh, that's got a geometric flavor to it so what 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 would this mean in the geometric setting so let's have a think about it so let's let's draw some, some sort of a curve. So we've got y, we've got x, and the curve is y equals f of x. Now, what do we know about what dy by dx actually tells us? Well, dy by dx tells us information about the gradient, okay? So if I'm saying that the gradient at some point is gonna be zero, then what that means is the tangent line at that point is going to be is going to be horizontal. So a candidate for that would be a point like this, because if I go to that point and I look at the tangent line to that point, the tangent line indeed is actually a horizontal line. So, so if, if that point has x value a, then what I can say is dy by dx at x equals a equals zero is actually the exact same thing as saying tangent line to curve y equals f of x 
at point AB is a horizontal line. And of course, to tie this up to, to my graph here, uh, what, I've, what I've said is if X is A and, and then Y better be F of A, which in this case we're saying we're going to give it a value B, right? So now we have a geometric view of, of what a stationary point is, as well as an algebraic one. The algebraic one being the condition here, which can equivalently be expressed as, a, as the condition here. And the geometric one, just to make this absolutely crystal clear, is actually the condition on the tangent line to the curve, which is, which is mentioned here. So given that we've just seen a rather abstract or technical definition of a stationary point, it's, it's worth seeing, seeing an example just so we have a better understanding of what, what, what the definition actually says. So let's try and calculate stationary point to the curve uh, ax squared plus bx plus c in this case. So solution. So we've got y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And of course, a better not be zero because otherwise if a is zero, then we don't really have a quadratic. We have a linear function bx plus c, right? Here I should also say where a, b and c are real numbers. A, B, and C are real numbers. So since we know that stationary points, so we know that stationary points, points satisfy dy by dx equals zero. This is the condition they satisfy, right? Uh, then we proceed directly, right? And what do I mean by that? We basically apply that condition, this, this condition here. We directly differentiate y. So since y is ax squared plus bx plus c, then differentiating it would just give me, we've seen this before in videos, parts one and two of the video series on differentiation. It's just going to be 2ax plus b. And indeed, we then set the condition that we want the derivative to be zero because that's what's going to happen at the stationary point which gives us 2ax plus b equals zero, which we can solve to say x equals minus b over 2a. Now this is our x value of our stationary point. And because we only have one solution for x in this case, there's only one stationary point. So let's work out the y value for our stationary point. While we know what the relationship between x and y is, the relationship between x and y is given by our equation of the curve. So we're going to go back to that and replace x with minus b over 2a everywhere. And then we'll just simplify and see what we end up with. So squaring, squaring the first thing, I'm going to get a times by b squared over 4a squared. And then b times by minus b is going to give me minus b squared. And obviously that's over 2a. And then the plus c just comes along for the ride. Now we can tidy a few things up here, which is this A is gonna cancel with one of these A's. And also looking at the second term to make sure that the denominator of the first term and the second term are the same, I'm gonna multiply both top and bottom by two, which then means I can say that I'm gonna end up with B squared over four A minus B squared over four A plus C, which, sorry, it should be minus two B squared over four A, uh, plus c, which obviously simplifies to give me minus b squared over 4a plus c, which I can combine as, as one fraction to get minus b squared plus 4ac divided by 2a. So the point is, there's only one stationary point. There is only one stationary point, and it is at it's at x is minus b over 2a and y is minus b squared plus 4ac over 2a. Should be somewhat amazed by what we've managed to, what we've managed to figure out because terms like minus, or expressions rather like minus b over 2a and minus b squared plus 4ac should be quite familiar to you from from a lot of work on quadratics from GCSE and obviously from the very very early stages of, of year one A level math. So these these expressions actually turn up in the formula for the um, solution to a quadratic, the general formula. Right? Now 
I would actually just just make a make a remark here. So let me let me make some room, and and the remark is is as follows. So so let's say let's say remark. Um, the stationary point in this case is actually the vertex of, of a quadratic. So what do I mean by this? Well, if we look at sort of a generic, a generic quadratic, then, then of course, let me just write down the generic equation where a is non-zero, crucially. So of course, in this case, well, where is uh, the tangent line going to be horizontal to this quadratic? Well, it's going to be about here, right? And we can we can visually we can visually see that it's going to be about there. So, so necessarily, uh, the stationary point is actually going to be the point in red there. But what do we know about the point in red? That actually also happens to be the vertex, right? And we know that because that's effectively where there's a perfect line of symmetry. So, so in this case, the fact that the stationary point gives us a vertex, and we also know that the vertex of a quadratic is actually very important in being able to describe a quadratic because it's, it's the point of perfect symmetry on the, on the quadratic if there is one. So that should really tell you that, in fact, stationary points are, are very, very important in, in understanding uh, lots and lots of mathematical objects, and in particular curves. So just to emphasize the, the point about the importance of stationary point or stationary points, uh, let's think about an alternative description of stationary points. So far, we've seen that stationary points are effectively sort of points on curves where, where the tangent to the curve is actually going to be horizontal. So in this case, this, this curve that I've drawn, the stationary point is probably going to be here. I mean, we're probably also going to have another one there, but let's just focus on on the first one I actually drew. So we're going to have a, a horizontal tangent there. However, another way of thinking about sort of stationary points, it, it turns out to be very useful. But before we do that, we need to have another way of thinking about what, what a derivative is. So, so dy by dx, this is the new way of thinking about the derivative, can be thought of as measuring the change in y as x is changed. So in other words, what I mean by that is dy by dx is telling us how sensitive y is to changes in x, right? So so let's pick some point here, for example, say say x naught. And for x naught, I'm going to stick that into my function. I'm going to get y equals f of x naught. And let's just for the sake of argument call that call that y naught. So that means that I'm going to get that y value here, right? And what dy by dx, so what dy by dx at the point x equals x naught actually tells me. It tells me that how sensitive the function is, the function y equals f of x is, to changes in x. So if I change, if I change my x value about x equals x naught a little bit, how much is there going to be a change in y, right? And if this happens to be, say, high, if this happens to be high, then what that means is, um, if I change x naught by a little bit, then y would change by a lot. Whereas if this happens to be to be low, what that means is if I change x naught by a little bit, well, then y y naught is not going to change by by a lot because because the change in y with respect to x is actually quite small. So, in the view of this this sort of way of looking at a derivative, what we can say is we can say clearly clearly stationary points are very special very special because these points are least sensitive to change.
in local x values. So what I mean by that is, is if I actually come to say, our stationary point or the x value here, the stationary point in red that I marked earlier, and if we now have a think about, well, okay, so I've got that x value here, and then the y value is obviously going to be there. Now, have a think. If I actually move to the left or right slightly, right, the y value doesn't actually change by much, correspondingly, right? So, so in some ways, stationary points are are very special because most functions, the more time you spend with mathematics, the more it sort of becomes obvious. Most functions are constantly changing, right? That's the constant affair of how functions are. So, so to go to a function and then to look at points where there isn't actually a lot of change happening locally, that's, that's very special and it normally gives us a lot of useful information about, about functions. Let's have a think about what it means to determine the nature of a stationary point. Well, what I mean by, by this is, uh, is as follows. So, a stationary point may be classified as either a maximum, a minimum, or a point of inflection. And loosely what this means is if I have some curve and we need not really think too much about, about axes necessarily, then, then a maximum is basically when we have a stationary point which is locally at a peak, right? So in this case, that point there would actually be my, be my maximum. And then a minimum would actually be a stationary point which is actually sort of not at a peak so it's at a trough or it's at a valley whichever way you want to think about it so this is our minimum and then the third case is when it's a bit like a horse saddle from a, from a side so a stationary point where it's neither a maximum nor a minimum which is a point of inflection point of inflection i should say uh in black perhaps, neither a maximum, neither max, nor min. Now the reason why we say this is determining the nature of a stationary point, because you see all of these are indeed stationary points, because if I draw tangents at these points to the, to the curves, then the tangents are going to be horizontal, horizontal lines, right? So, so they are all stationary points, but they are not all the same necessarily. So, so this, this is basically a way of determining the nature of a stationary point as a way of classifying them as saying either it's of one type or of another type. So how do we mathematically classify stationary points? Well, we actually do that by using something called the second derivative test. Before I write down the statement of the second derivative test, I should briefly say what a second derivative is. So if we have a function, so if we have something like y equals f of x, then we can obviously differentiate it to get dy by dx is being f prime x, right? This thing here technically is the first derivative, right? Now the point is that this thing here is actually a function in itself because what differentiation does, if we go back to the very initial definition in terms of limits, is it takes in a function and it gives out a function. So after I've done the differentiation, the thing I've ended up with is still a function. So what we can say, we can actually, actually differentiate f prime, should say again, right, to get a new function. And this function is written as follows. So we say we start with dy by dx, which is obviously f prime x, and then we now, we differentiate dy by dx. So the way we write that down is we say d2y by dx squared. And obviously we say two because we're still differentiating y with respect to x, but there's a two there saying that actually this is not the first time we're doing it. And the way we write this in Newton's notation is we write the function down and we put two primes on top. 
and obviously the x just comes along for the ride notationally. So that's what a second derivative is. Now, what is the second derivative test? The second derivative test basically says, uh, so, so, so the statement is as follows, given that there is a stationary point at AB on curve y equals f of x, then we must have one of the three things. So case one is that the second derivative at x equals a is actually zero, say. Case two is the second derivative at x equals a is positive. And case three is that the second derivative at x equals a is negative. So what the second derivative test says is when you go to the stationary point and you differentiate not the function, but you differentiate the derivative that you've already got, and then you evaluate that derivative at the value of the stationary point, so x equals a, you're either going to get zero, you're going to get something positive, or you're going to get something negative. And depending on, depending on whether it's positive, negative, or zero, you, you, you can say what type of stationary point it is. So if it's actually if it's actually positive, then that actually gives us the fact that the stationary point is a minimum, right? And if it's negative, then that tells us that the stationary point is actually a maximum. And if it's zero, I'm going to write this in red because it's a very special case, that tells us that the stationary point is actually a point of inflection. So this is basically the statement of, of the second derivative test. So we should actually think about why the second derivative test is saying something something useful. Um, so let's let's try and try and see that. So let's start with just say some part of a curve which is which is giving us a stationary point. So there's a stationary point there, obviously, right? And let's have a think about how the tangents to the curves are, to this curve are going to behave. So at this point here, the tangent's clearly going to be very very negative, right? And then if I move further along the curve at this point, the tangent's still negative, but it's actually less negative. At the point in red, the tangent actually happens to be zero, right? The gradient of the tangent actually happens to be zero. It's actually a horizontal, horizontal line. And if I move further along now, the tangent is not gonna be, not gonna have a negative gradient. It's actually gonna have a positive gradient. And if I, if I move further along, I'm gonna have a much more positive gradient. So what's happening here? My tangents along the curve are changing, right? And how are they changing? Well, they're going from being, they're starting out at being very, very negative. So I should say very negative, And then they're becoming sort of less negative, right? And then it becomes zero. And then it becomes sort of uh, positive. And then finally, it becomes very positive. So, so the, the tangents, so the gradient of our various tangents are actually increasing. How do we know they're increasing? Because they're going from something which is very negative to something that's very positive. So they've got to be going up, right? But d2y by dx squared, in other words, the second derivative, is precisely the object which measures the change in dy by dx. Right? In other words, it's precisely the thing which measures how my gradients are changing. So in this case, if I write this in pink above here, we see directly that when my change in 
the gradient of tangents is actually increasing, so it's positive, then we have an associated minimum. Right? And the same sort of argument can be replicated in the case where, where we have a maximum. And uh, again, a similar analysis like this will actually give us sort of an, an, an understanding of uh, what happens in the case of, of a point of inflection. But for now, we, we, will, we will leave this here. So having seen a lot of theory with regards to nature of stationary points, let's do an example to get this concretely in our, in our minds. So we've got to determine the stationary points on this general quadratic here, and we've also got to then determine the nature of the stationary points, whether they're maximum, minimums, or points of inflection. Now, we've already actually, in the first example, seen this quadratic, and we showed that stationary point, let's just think about the x value now, was actually at minus b over 2a. Okay, minus b over 2a. We need not worry about the y value, for, for the second derivative test. So uh, how are we gonna determine its nature? So let's, let's do that directly, determining the nature of the stationary point, right? So we need to apply the second derivative test, but for that we need the second derivative. So the first derivative is obviously just gonna be 2ax plus b, and that then tells me that the second derivative is actually just going to be 2a. And because a is, is a constant, I should have said zero here earlier, actually, because a is a constant, uh, so I should say here now, since a is a real non-zero, non-zero, constant, we must have that either A is positive or A is negative. So let's look at case one. So case one is where A is positive. Well, that tells me that the second derivative is actually 2A is also positive, which tells me that the stationary point is actually a minimum, right? And this is very consistent with what we're told throughout the GCSE and sort of A-level syllabus, which is if you've got if you've got a quadratic of the form of the of the generic form that we've actually got here, namely there, then if A is positive, then it's going to be a happy quadratic, right? We're told this sort of thing. So if A is positive, we're going to get a happy we're going to get a happy quadratic. And of course, that's really, really useful because a happy quadratic is going to have a minimum and that's precisely what our case one actually shows, right? So let's now think about case two. So case two is going to be the other case where A is negative. Well, if A is negative, then the second derivative is actually 2A and that's also negative, which actually by the second derivative test tells me that the stationary point is actually a maximum right and again we can sort of come back here now and we can say well the other case is that a is negative and if a is negative we were always told that our quadratic is actually going to be sad face upside down right which is again consistent with what our second derivative test is telling us because it's telling us then our stationary point is actually going to be a maximum so i hope this gives you this gives you a little bit of better understanding of of how determining nature of stationary points uh, ties into the second derivative test and how you actually do some of these calculations. We will look at more, more sort of explicit examples uh, sort of later on in the next, in, in the next video or so in this, in this series. Just so we're not completely ignoring points of inflection, I thought it's worth considering an example where points of inflection actually show up. So in this case, where we again sort of have to do what we did in examples one and two, but now our results are going to be somewhat, somewhat different. So let's, let's have a think about this. We've got to determine stationary points that occur curve y equals x cubed. Well, how do we get stationary points? We get them 
by first of all differentiating the function so we're going to get 3x squared and then we know that stationary points satisfy dy by dx equals 0. So since they satisfy dy by dx equals 0 that tells me that I've actually got a set 3x squared to 0 to get stationary points for my for my cubic here which then tells me, well, there's only one way of solving this, which is x squared equals 0 divided by 3, which is 0. And of course, when we take the square root of 0, we only get one repeated solution. We get x equals 0. And just so we actually work out the point itself, we can say y equals x cubed is actually going to be 0 cubed, which is actually going to be 0. So stationary point at 0, 0 of our curve y equals x cubed. So we've worked out the stationary point. And of course, there's only one stationary point in this case, because we only have one solution for x, and therefore we can only get one value for y. And this shouldn't actually surprise us, because if we go back and actually look at the cubic, the cubic looks, it's a, it's a very standard sort of curve, which actually does this sort of thing, where it, where it passes through, through the center. I'll stick to my convention of parking stationary points in red, where it passes through the center. So we know that there is going to be a stationary point there. Now let's determine its nature. So how do I determine its nature? Well, I apply the second derivative test. So we apply the second derivative test. So to be able to do that, I need to work out the second derivative. That's my first derivative. So I'm going to differentiate that function to get my second derivative. So when I actually differentiate this function, I actually get 6x. And of course, the second derivative test says it's not just good enough to differentiate it, but I actually have to, I actually have to evaluate it at the value of the stationary point, right? So in this case, we know what the x value of the stationary point is, is x equals 0. I'm going to substitute x equals 0 into my formula, which is going to give me 6 times 0, which of course is 0. And by, in fact, the very first case of how we wrote down the second derivative test, uh, the statement for the second derivative test, we know that since the second derivative is zero, that actually tells us that the stationary point is actually is a point of inflection. And of course, what this means is, I'll just sort of reiterate myself here, is if I zoom in a lot into, into this, this region here, what I'll find is momentarily at x equals zero, the curve actually becomes horizontal. So indeed the tangent at that point is gonna be a horizontal line, uh, but on either side of that, uh, you can't just say it's gonna be sort of maximum or minimum. So in other words, it's not gonna be like that or like that, right? So I can't clearly say that, that, my, that my stationary point is going to be either a maximum or a minimum. Indeed, it's definitely not going to be, it's definitely not going to be this or the other. So let's think about the third use of differentiation that we actually wrote down, which is uh, for de describing increasing and decreasing functions. So let's define what we mean by an increasing function. So I would say a function f of x is increasing if f prime of x is actually positive for all x in the domain of f. In other words, if I go to a graph, is for all the x values that the function can take in, if the function has gradient, in other words, obviously the other way of writing that is this, if the gradient is positive, then, then the function is said to be increasing. And obviously if that's the case, then the function is gonna have to look something like this, give or take. Because as we can see, what's happening is the gradient here is positive, the gradient here is positive, the gradient here is positive, the gradient here is positive. So all the way along the function, along the curve, the tangent lines are going to be pointing sort of upwards. So that's, that's very intuitive. That's very, very intuitive in sort of describing the notion of increasing because that's, that's exactly what's, what's happening. So let's define its counterpart, which is 
decreasing function. Right, so a function f of x is decreasing if f prime x is actually negative for all x in the, in the domain. And again, for consistency, I will just say another way of saying that is that dy by dx is negative. And of course, as far as getting a picture is concerned, we're gonna have something similar to what we've got up there, but now the curves are gonna be pointing downwards because just, just like above, we go to each point on the curve and we see, well, what's the tangent gonna be like? Well, the tangent for that green chunk is gonna be pointing downwards, so it's gonna be negative. The gradient of the tangent is actually gonna be negative. Similarly for there, similarly for there, and indeed for the, for the entire curve itself. So the one remark that is that is worth making at this stage, which I'll, which I'll do here, remark, note that when f prime of x is not zero, i.e. when dy by dx uh, is, is not zero, I should maybe tidy that up a little bit, is not zero, then it is either bigger than zero or less than zero. Let's put that in inverted commas, right? So what I'm trying to say to you is, is if the gradient is non-zero, then it, then it must either be positive or it must be negative, right? So in other words, if you have a function that is just an increasing function, it's not gonna have a stationary point. And if you have a function that's just a decreasing function, it's not going to have a stationary point. So if a function happens to have a stationary point, then a chunk of that function is probably going to be increasing. And another chunk of that function is probably going to be decreasing, right? In, in whatever combination that we can, we, can, we can think of. I hope that idea was quite clear. So moving on to the last point um, on, our, on our list of uses for differentiation, which is describing complicated relationships. Now, this is quite hard to sort of get a get your head around if I start to give general descriptions. Uh, this sort of thing is best learned by doing specific questions and an and example and so on and so forth. So what I would do is I would try and explain the idea with the, with the use of an example. So let's think about speed. Now, the minute I say speed, we should think about the definition of speed. And of course, speed is defined to be distance, distance over time. Right, that's what speed is, which is can be written nicely in an equation. But obviously, what some people don't realize sometimes is this is only valid, valid for describing constant speeds. Right, so what I mean by that is this is only really sensible if a car is moving on a motorway at a fixed speed. If the car is constantly changing its speed, or say if the wind is constantly sort of ebbing and flowing and changing its speed, or an aeroplane has very different speed from when it takes off to when it's in the air to when it's about to land or whatever, then, then this formula alone is not actually good enough. In that case, we have to have a, a sort of a, a more generic definition of speed, which is speed is the rate of change of distance with respect to time. Right, so just to make some symbols up here, if I say my speed, let me write this in a slightly better way, uh, my speed, I'm gonna actually go by the symbol V, my distance, I'm actually gonna go by the symbol S and my time, I'm, I'm going to go by the symbol T, then my speed is actually now given, given by the equation. V is actually ds dt. And in this case, because this here is a function, then this here is also a function. And what is this a function of? Well, it's a function of time. And this makes perfect sense because our speed in this case is not necessarily constant. 
right? So perhaps I should say this here. So, oops, since speed is non-constant, it changes over time. Right. And this is precisely what I mean as an example of a situation where we're describing something rather complicated. Uh, and it shouldn't take too much imagination to go from, from seeing that to being able to think, think through and think, hang on, we're going to need derivatives in all sorts of applications of when anything is moving. Right. Indeed, if you're doing it with the physics or mechanics, then the Newton's second laws are basically written down in terms of derivatives and so on and so forth. So with that, I think I'll, I'll end the video here. Um, we, we hope you liked the video. If you found the video useful, please do uh, uh, leave, a, leave, leave a like and, and, and subscribe perhaps. Uh, do let us know in the comment section what you would like to see more videos on uh, and we will see you next time.